force or uh, changing your mind is uh, the idea of being sorry for an outcome being sorry that something happened and it's not the same thing as um, when you are saying that you have changed your heart about something. Uh, the other word for repent it means to turn around and go the other direction. This word doesn't mean that at all. Um, it just means that he changed his. Uh, he was sorry that something had happened. Uh, you know, so it's like when you're when you're busted for something. Oh man, I'm really sorry. But you're only sorry because you got busted. Now we don't know if Judas. Well, the reason he was sorry was there, there, one of the explanations for why Judas did what he did is that he was trying to force Jesus to use his supernatural powers to become the political Messiah that he really wanted Jesus to be. So he thought, I'll put Jesus in a box, I'll put him in a place that forces him to call upon God and you know, call lightning down from heaven and destroy the Romans and the religious leaders and take over. And when instead, Jesus barely said a word, and then he said the most stupid thing he could could have, yeah, I'm the Messiah, and from now on you're going to see the Son of Man coming in, in power, and I'll be at the right hand of God Most High. And Judas is going, you know, that was dumb. That's the only thing you could have said that would have gotten you condemned. Yeah, that was the idea. Judas did not understand what Jesus was really coming to do. So he wants to drop the charges, but basically it's too late. Judas wants to return the money, and the, the chief priests and the elders won't have anything to do with it. They won't put the money back in the temple treasury because it's unclean money. He really admits his wrong to the wrong person. Had Judas really repented in the, ch in the sense of changing his mind, turning around, going the other direction, the person he would have needed to confess to would have been Jesus himself. Now, I believe if, he, if Judas had done that, Jesus would have forgiven him. And Judas' end would have been very, very different. Because no matter what you have done, no matter how horrible you are, turning to, and this is what we'll see as the kind of the key to this whole thing, turning to Jesus and away from your evil ways is the way out. So no matter how awful you are, you turn to cling to Jesus and you find forgiveness. But Judas would not turn to Jesus. Instead, he did really the most, um, the most selfish thing that he could have done. He went out and hanged himself. Now, Acts chapter 1 says that he fell from a tree branch. So probably what happened was that he hung himself from a tree branch. The tree branch broke. And uh, it says that when his body hit the ground, it split open. Pretty gross. And then blood spilled on the ground, and that's why it's called the field of blood. Now it also says that Judas bought the field, but we know from this account that it was actually the, the chief priests and the elders, but they were using Judas's money. So really both things kind of work. Um, so they purchased this field that may have been known for its clay soil. It was probably located in the Kidron Valley, which is uh, the valley there uh, next to Jerusalem. And so they used it as a place to bury foreigners. And they said that it was a fulfillment of a prophecy spoken by Jeremiah. It was actually literally a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 11 verses 12 and 13. However, the, there was a common view in those days that Jeremiah had actually been the one that had collated a lot of the prophetic uh, words that had been spoken. And so to say it was fulfillment of Jeremiah, that works even though it came from Zechariah. However, if you check out Jeremiah chapter 18, chapter 19, and chapter 32, and you start reading some of the stuff, you're going, hey, I recognize this. This has to do with Judas and this buying this plot of land. So Judas, in, in Acts chapter 1, uh, it says that Judas left to go to his own place. And we presume that is hell, a, a place of permanent... A uh, place where you're permanently uh, away from the presence of God. Um, suicide is really a very selfish act because it's taking life that is a gift from God 
and destroying it. And I know people do come to the place where they feel like their only way out is to commit suicide. I, I would suggest to you that is mostly out of horrible desperation in a place where you don't see any other way out. So it's, it's not like everybody that feels like they want to commit suicide is like Judas. Not the same thing. And you should know that no matter what horrible box you may find you're in, no matter what desperate place, God does have a way out if you will reach out to Him. Now, people think that suicide is an answer. It's a, it's a, a way to get out of the, the bad place you're in, and it's not. It's, it's like if you're in a difficult family or marriage situation, you think, oh, if I could just get free of that marriage or that family, then everything will be okay. And you don't realize that you're, you're, you're not going to be free of any of it. Not really. So let's talk about Peter. Peter failed God too. Pretty big time, I think, we see. You know, when, when it came down to it, he did the wrong thing. You know, he, first he tried to rescue Jesus. Then he ran away, and then he denied him altogether. He betrayed Jesus by not standing by his oaths, his promises. And we see here that Peter went out and wept bitterly. This was a life-changing moment for Peter. He would no longer be the self-assured, quick to speak, assertive leader that he had been. After his denial of Jesus, instead he would be a repentant and humble servant. Would we all experience that same transformation? That's interesting to me. In reading through the Gospels, Peter's name is mentioned a lot, isn't it? It's Peter this, and Peter said that, and Peter did this, and Peter did that. This is the last time Peter is mentioned by name in the Gospel of Matthew. In Mark's Gospel, after the resurrection, an angel tells Mary, go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Uh-oh. And you got to wonder if Peter's thinking, boy, am I going to get it now. I have blown it so bad, there is no way back. Jesus ought to just come, and instead of cutting off my ear, he ought to cut my head off, because I have failed him miserably. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, records Peter running to look into the empty tomb and then going back home, marveling at what had happened. And then a little hint comes... In verse 38, when Jesus, who had, you know, suddenly appeared to the disciples after the resurrection, he said, why are you troubled? And boy, were they troubled. They were quaking in their boots. They had all done what they didn't want to do in running away from Jesus, and they were behind locked doors. John chapter 20, verses 3 through 10, record to us the little foot race that happened after uh, Mary saw the risen Lord. Uh, where John and Peter uh, had a little sprint to the tomb. Uh, John is very careful to record, not once but twice, that he beat Peter in that foot race. I always find that's kind of interesting. And John's got a little sense of humor, I think. <clears throat> and the disciple that Jesus loved and Peter went to the tomb, and the disciple that Jesus loved arrived first, of course. <laughs> it tells us that they went to the tomb, but they thought someone had taken Jesus' body. And it says they did not yet understand that he had risen. So it was all black, no white for these guys. And then even after the resurrection, when Jesus appears to his men, Peter is not mentioned by name at all. you got to wonder if, like in the courtyard of the high priest, as he moved further and further away from the firelight in order to be incognito, that when Jesus came back, instead of standing in front as the leader, as the man always first, always to speak, Peter instead hung on the outside, hung on the outskirts of the room, not wanting to make eye contact with Jesus, not wanting that look again to recognize between the two of them that he had failed. Turn with me to John chapter 21. When next we meet Peter, it is after the resurrection, sometime, but sometime before Jesus ascended. And in verse 3 of John chapter 21, Simon Peter said to them, 
I'm going fishing. All right, I put in the, uh, you know, the shortened form of the words there. I'm going fishing. It's like he's saying, you know, I've done it. I've done the worst that you